2007, we decided to establish an architectural practice uh, and a studio residency here in Betzahur, in Bethlehem. We wanted to engage with the spatial reality of the conflict over Palestine, not only critically, but also proactively. Um, we felt that it was not enough, in a way, describing how checkpoints work and how the walls is being built. We went also, despite the situation, to propose something, to be propositive. We know how much urban planning and architecture played a very important role on the colonization over Palestine. So, the basic idea, the basic question that we had was how to use architecture of the occupation against itself. We wanted to use architecture more as an arena of speculation to bring ideas. And in order to keep the distance from the current term of solution, we proposed the term of decolonization. We wanted to avoid uh, just this top-down perspective, the one state, the two states, the three states, so what is the solution of this conflict? We propose a term, decolonization, mainly as not just dreaming a day after, but as a political practice of the present that is basically a struggle for justice and equality. And without ju just dreaming that one day there will be a solution, it's a struggle that never ends. Decolonizing architecture deals with a fundamental question. How to reuse the architecture of Israel colonization at the moment which is unplugged from the political power that charges it. So in order to answer to this question, um, we found basically three different approaches. The first one is just destroying the colonial architecture. So this might be the first emotional reaction, right? So colonial architecture embody power relations. So when we start to work on this, the first reaction was just, you know, want to get rid of them. But also we know that this might not be the best solution. You might remember in Gaza in 2005, uh, Israel evacuated Gaza um, and destroyed more than 3,000 homes. The rubbles of these homes are still there and these areas have not been used. So maybe the structure might not be actually the best solution or not always. The second possibility is just reusing them. And we know through colonial history how much, for example, um, new uh, government reuse old colonial architecture. But also this, the simple reuse of colonial architecture is also dangerous. We know again that was an interesting discussion in post-colonial India between Nero and Gandhi, because Gandhi was against reusing British colonial architecture. And here, for example, in our discussion that we had in several meetings with municipalities, with NGOs, with different individuals, they were afraid that what can happen in Palestine, that instead of changing, let's say, removing the colonizer, then you get a Palestinian gated community. And unfortunately, this is already happening somewhere, where you basically use the same fences, the same gates, and then what you just remove is that you have a new Palestinian elite, and these places cannot be used by all Palestinians. But there exists also a third possibility, the one that maybe is most difficult, and the one that we try to engage with and to imagine, which is basically how it's possible to reorient the colonial architecture towards aims different from one they were designed for. Try to subvert its uses. And I want to give you an example of this. Here in Palestine, the Mukata, the Mukata in Ramallah. As you might know, this was already a British uh, military uh, compound, then was turned to be a Jordanian, and then an Israeli. There was a very interesting moment, just a few weeks, 
that worked in a very different way. There were many Palestinians that were imprisoned in Mukata before. They were tortured. And during some certain weeks, they bring their families. So that the buildings, the Mukata start to work completely and radically differently. There was the ways in which they could talk about what happened to them. They were in a way coming back to the society. So this building was actually not anymore a military compound, but was a building that allowed them to talk about the, the story and sharing them the stories with the people. This is just an example of how I think it's important really open up our imagination now, during the colonization, the ways in which Israeli colonial architecture can be one day reused. I want to show you just two examples, two side projects. The first one, one is in the north of Jerusalem. It's very close to Ramallah. It's uh, Psagot. And the second one is Oshgrab. So the first case is a colony that maybe all of you maybe saw, saw it, but or, or Palestinians from, from Ramallah, they know this presence, which is there. So the relation with El Bire Ramallah urban fabric is very clear. The settlement is on top of the hill, dominating the entire area. So this was our first case of investigation. Uh, so when we started to discuss with the people that were living there, the first thing we asked them, so imagine that you know they will uh, evacuate tomorrow. So how are you going to reuse this place? The first issues that all Palestinians tell us was, of course, ownership. Who owns the land? Now, as you know, most of the settlements actually are built on what is collective Palestinian land. This is, was the way in which, in which the Israeli managed to expropriate the land, saying this is for public uses. And of course, public means Israeli state-owned, doesn't mean Palestinians. And this is why here in Palestine, you have a polarization. You have all private land or you have public land. And this is why, you know, very much any collective space, there is a lack of public space and collective spaces. Now, if you look to colonial architecture in this way, what you will discover suddenly, that all the settlements can be reused for collective uses, for public uses. So imagining an evacuation of the settlements will imagine also that suddenly you have very important and strategically uh, located areas and suddenly it can be reused by, uh, by the community. So what we designed, what we call an manual of decolonization. So we are not waiting the day after, okay? We have to be prepared. So we as architects say, as much as you decide, as the politicians, that it's going to be an evacuation, don't tell us, you know, technically it's difficult, you know, these are facts on the ground, we cannot, cannot be changed it. We produce a manual of decolonization, manual of architectural decolonization that suggests ways in which, for example, three single house families actually can be combined together and be transformed in a school, in a kindergarten, in a clinic, something that the Palestinian community needs. This also will avoid the problem that I tried to describe before, that in a way only certain Palestinians will use what was before Israeli occupied land. So that suddenly these places can be part of the Palestinian community. And that sense also will be also the place where you just not, let's say, forget about the occupation or not just make a tabula rasa and thinking that maybe this allowed you to forget, not making a museum, but actually being active. And this architecture can be reused in a very different way. And you might say, you know, but this is a very theoretical, it's a speculation. Yes, it was somewhere. But also there were a few um, zones of Palestine that were liberated by the direct Israeli presence. One of them is also here in Bethlehem. It's called Oshigrab. It was a, a, a military outpost. There was, again, strategically located at the, at the entrance of, um, of Bethlehem. This case for us also was a very important case because it demonstrated in a way you can start to act and start to look at this project as a possibility of imagining this day after. And this is what happened, that Palestinians entered the Oshigrab military base and they took everything. There was a violence against the building and we had a lot of conversation about this violence against the building. 
And I can tell you that already this conversation for us was extremely important because where some Palestinians will say, you know, we have to prevent this violence against the building. So we have to use the checkpoint and we have to use the Palestinian police so that the Palestinians will not enter and destroy everything. We say, um, we, maybe this not by, might be the best option. I think there will be a moment that certain kind of violence, like violence against this architectural of occupation, might take place, okay? And only after that, we as architects maybe can imagine something different. So, with the municipality of Petzahur, on the side of the hill, we um, help them to, um, to think about a public park. That of course might sound, you know, for many, like something very banal and, and usual, but in a city like Bethlehem, you don't have public park. You don't have, because you don't have basically public land, because as I mentioned before, public land is the ways in which actually Israel operates to expropriate land. So, and to tell you how much this is a kind of important project, that this is not only Area C, where the Palestinians cannot build anything, as 60% of the West Bank, but is also still, there is a military order on that. So there was a very courageous municipality that actually uh, start to think about reusing this place and is still working. However, we are not, I'm not, you know, living in a, outside of this country. I live here and I know there is a colonization going on. So after two years, new settlers around the Bethlehem area started to, um, wanted to establish a new settlement. They call it Dema. So we started a kind of uh, battle that is, shows here a kind of graffiti battle. Okay, so they arrive on the side, they bring the flag, they write on the buildings, and the day after we remove them. They came back, but also we came back. So this goes for a long period of time. But at the same time, working with a Palestinian uh, NGO, the Palestinian Wildlife Association, we also understand how much is important this site for the migration of the birds. There are millions of birds migrating from Lebanon towards Palestine to Egypt. So we started also to, as a provocation to the civilian administration and the Israeli army, to think about that maybe this place should go back to the nature. In this case, we make holes, continue the destruction and the violence on, against this colonial architecture that allowed the birds to nest in, uh, in this building. So every time that we presented the, our projects, the, the first reaction was actually always a smile. In the beginning, we couldn't understand why. Maybe, you know, we are just appear to be very strange and maybe even ridiculous to propose these projects. But also, then, we start to interpret this smile as the first moment where actually you can see the possibility to plan your future, the possibility of an agency, the possibility of not just waiting, you know, the political solution, but maybe something also that help you to decolonize the mind, because what we are very much interested in is not just, let's say, decolonizing architecture in terms of architectural proposal, but we want to use architecture, the ways in which actually people can start to think about their future and can start to think about how this architecture can be used tomorrow. Thank you very much.